Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to come to New York again and meet so many friends, both old and new. First of all, let me thank Ambassador Hills, Mr. Greenberg, also the President, for their very warm and friendly remarks. And those are rarely heard today in the United States. It seems that to say some kind words about China-U.S. relations needs courage for the time being. I very much appreciate the fact that the much-respected Dr. Kissinger, in his message, shared with us many insights. And he stressed in particular that under the current circumstances, it is all the more important for China and the United States to enhance dialogue. And he highlighted the imperativeness and urgency for China-U.S. dialogue. I fully agree with his point. And today, it is such a good opportunity to do that. During last year's Anga Leaders Week, I spoke at the Council on Foreign Relations, and I argued that the crux of the China-U.S. relationship was the U.S. perception of China, a China that is uh, constantly growing and developing. I asked the audience to think really hard about the key questions. Is the peaceful, cooperative, and open China an opportunity or a challenge for the United States? Is the proactive and constructive China on the world stage a partner or an adversary for the United States? One year on, these questions are still being debated in the United States, which seems to be leading to two different views. And in my conversation during dinner, American friends also shared with me this reality. Well, this may not be a bad thing for a relationship as important and complex as China-U.S. relations, as debates will help people get closer to facts and truth. I believe at the end of the day, American friends will reach sensible consensus and find the right answer to those questions. Well, present here today are long-time friends of China. Before I expound on the government's position, I want to take this opportunity and to, on this occasion of the 40th anniversary of China-U.S. diplomatic relations, on behalf of the Chinese government, to all those who are devoted and contributed to this important relationship, I want to express our deep appreciation to all your efforts. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the founding of the PRC, as well as the 40th anniversary of our diplomatic relations. Confucius said, at the age of 40, there should be no confusion. This is a historic moment that means a lot to both countries. We need to stand high, look far, and take this bilateral relationship forward with vision and conviction. Over the past four decades, these relations have weathered many twists and turns, yet it has steadily moved forward with progress beyond even the Buddhist imagination. Dr. Kissinger actually said that, not me. It has brought tremendous benefits to both nations and contributed greatly to peace, stability, and prosperity across the world. On the other hand, however, China-U.S. relations today have once again come to a crossroads. Some people are using every means to depict China as a major adversary. marketing their prophecy that the relationship is doomed to fall into the Thucydides trap, the clash of civilizations trap, and even clamor for a full decoupling with China. And several speakers all touch upon this alarming and worrisome trend. 
or inclination. Therefore, this giant ship of China-U.S. relations is faced with two very different routes. One features calm seas and broad prospects. The other is churning waters and raging waves. It begs the question where the China-U.S. relations will go in the next 40 years. Are we going to move ahead along the right route or veer onto the wrong one with endless troubles waiting ahead? When we assess and decide on such a momentous issue, we must turn to history and look at the past four decades of China-U.S. relations for inspiration and guidance. The past has already revealed to us the following. First, mutually beneficial cooperation is the only right option for China and the U.S and neither country has taken advantage of the other. There is a claim in the U.S. that the country has been ripped off in its cooperation with China. Is that really so? I'm confident that our presence present here today are aware of the facts. Of course, this is not the fact. The truth is both countries have benefited tremendously from cooperation in the past 40 years, such cooperation, enhanced by our comparative strengths, has helped to drive robust growth of the U.S. economy, substantially cut the cost of living for American families, and enabled American firms to take home huge profits. Over four decades, China-U.S. trade in goods surged by 252 times. A UHCBC report found that between 2009 and 2018, U.S. exports to China alone have supported more than 1.1 million jobs in the U.S. 97% of the U.S. companies surveyed reported profits from doing business with China. And trade with China had saved 850 U.S. dollars for every U.S. family on, a, on an annual average. Economic Globalization, as the trend of the times, should not and cannot be held back. The free flow of resources enabled by globalization has created enormous wealth, yet it would also lead to uneven development within countries and trade imbalances between countries. A phenomenon that is widely seen the right approach to tackle the domestic challenge is to deepen reform and improve and adjust the distribution system. And issues between nations should be addressed by enhancing global governance through equal dialogue and consultation. Neither scapegoating nor unilaterally initiating a trade war is the right prescription. The trade frictions between China and the U.S. in the past year and more have inflicted losses on both countries, losses that shouldn't have happened. Higher tariffs have raised the production costs of American firms, pushed up U.S. consumer prices, and dampened the growth potential of the U.S. economy. Businesses, farmers, and consumers of the U.S. have felt the mounting pressures. For instance, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York estimated that due to the additional tariffs imposed on the 250 billion U.S. dollars of Chinese exports in 2018, U.S. consumers have to spend an extra $52.8 billion every year. That is $414 more in expenditure for every U.S. family. According to the Trade Partnership, an American consulting service, a 25% additional tariff on the $300 billion of imports from China, or maybe even 30% of additional tariff, will make at least 2 million American jobs disappear, drive up household costs by over $2,000, and wipe out 
of US GDP. These are not figures from Chinese institutions. These are the statistics and conclusions from reputable US institutions and firms. These figures show that only cooperation between us will benefit both countries and the world, and trade frictions will only hurt both sides and the whole world. Second, opening up and integration represents the right direction, and neither China nor the United States can move ahead without the other. Over the past four decades, China-U.S. relations have grown in sync with China's reform and opening up, as well as globalization of the world economy. The two countries are now among the most important trading partners and investment destinations for each other. Our industrial supply and value chains are deeply interconnected, our interests closely entwined. In 2018, bilateral trade exceeded $630 billion, and two-way investment surpassed $240 billion in cumulative terms. China has become a major export destination for U.S. aircraft, farm products, automobiles, and integrated circuits. Of all U.S. exports in 2017, 57% of soybeans, 25% of aircraft, 20% of automobiles, 14% of integrated circuits, and 17% of cotton was sold to China. At present, there are five million travels between our two countries every year. That translates to 17,000 passengers every day. And one flight either takes off or touches down every 17 minutes. Given the size of our economies and the level of interdependence, the so-called decoupling or shutting the door to each other is just like an attempt to build castles in the air. It is neither sensible nor realistic. After several decades of hard work of the Chinese people, the Chinese economy has grown from a small pond to something as big as a vast ocean. China is now the world's second largest importer of goods and services. It has the world's biggest and most promising market with the largest and fastest growing middle income population. Decoupling from the Chinese economy would be to decouple from opportunities and from the future. The US business community should well appreciate this logic. According to US statistics, despite the ongoing trade frictions, US companies invested $6.9 billion in China in the first half of this year, an increase of 1.5% over the average level in the same period of the last two years. 87% of U.S. companies in China stated that they would stay in the Chinese market because the advanced supply chain and labor force in China are just irreplaceable. Seventy-four percent of the members of the American Chamber of Commerce in China plan to invest more in China. In addition, opening up is China's set state policy. China will not close its door of opening up. The door will only open even wider. We fulfilled as early as in 2010 our tariff reduction commitments made upon joining the WTO. Currently, our average tariff has dropped to 7.5%. Our WTO accession commitment was 10%. So we have overfulfilled that commitment. I was also talking to Mr. Evan Greenberg that among all the developing countries, China has the lowest average tariff level. 
for example, that figure for India and Brazil is 13% and more. China has also taken the initiative to host an international expo on imports, opening its market and sharing its development opportunities with all other partners. China is accelerating its structural reform. This month, we announced a further opening of the Chinese market by abolishing the Q fee and uh, RQ fee investment quotas. I also share this information in our friend with our friends, and uh, our American friends have also felt the robust steps of opening of the financial sector in China. As you may know, that average manufacturing sector has been fully liberalized in China. The foreign investment law has been passed, and the law, as well as its matching regulations, will enter into force next year to foster a fairer and more transparent business environment governed by a sound legal framework. The management model of pre-establishment national treatment and negative list is being applied in wider areas. And the foreign investors will find the negative list getting shorter and shorter year by year. Yet opening up should also go both ways. While China opens wider to the US and the rest of the world, we expect the US to do the same to China and remove all unreasonable restrictions. In a word, China's efforts and achievements of reform and opening up in the past several decades have been widely recognized. They should not be deliberately ignored or denied. The fact that China's development and progress in the past several decades has brought enormous benefits to countries in wider world, including the United States, is beyond dispute and should be distorted or discredited by no one. Third, conflict and confrontation will lead nowhere and neither country can mold the other in one's own image. Since China and the US differ from each other in history, culture, social system, development path, and national conditions, it is natural for us to have disagreements and even frictions. What matters most is how to perceive objectively and handle them properly. Over 2,000 years ago, Chinese sage Confucius observed, a gentleman seeks harmony without uniformity, whereas a petty man does the converse. Making the case that real harmony is anchored upon recognition of and respect for disparities. Your great philosopher, Ralph Waldo Emerson of the 19th century, as told to me by my colleague, wrote that in true friendship, both parties recognize the deep identity which, beneath their disparities, unites them. The two philosophers, the living millenniums apart, have spoken to the same truth. The advance of human civilization must not stop, still less go backward. Differences and disparities should not be a chasm that prevents people from engaging each other, but impetus to mutual learning and shared progress. In the early years of the People's Republic of China, the United States sought an all-out containment of China. The two countries even fought a war on the Korean Peninsula, which was followed by 22 years of estrangement and confrontation. General Omar Bradley, then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, called what happened in Korea the wrong war at wrong place at the wrong time and with the wrong enemy. 
It wasn't until the 1970s that things began to change. Dr. Kissinger's secret visit to China and the meetings between President Richard Nixon and Chairman Mao Zedong and Premier Zhou Enlai reopened the door of contact and set us on a path toward peaceful coexistence and joint pursuit of prosperity. The ups and downs in our relations provide ample evidence that confrontation and conflict is not in the fundamental interests of either China or the U.S. Dialogue and cooperation is the only way to go. Some Americans claim that the U.S. decades-long engagement policy has failed in its original purpose of changing China and that it is time to revert back to the containment policy. Such an idea of molding others according to one's own wish is wrong from the very starting point and cannot possibly work. Seventy years on, it is important for the United States to avoid picking another misguided fight with the wrong country. The world we live in is a diverse place. In modern times, China made hard explorations and repeated attempts in its quest for development and revitalization, including once introducing the Western system, yet those efforts did not succeed because they did not meet China's national conditions and needs. It was until when the Communist Party of China applied the Marxist theories in light of China's own national conditions that China found a path that leads to prosperity of the country and happiness of the people. That is the path of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Standing the test of time in the past four, seven decades, this path has proven to be the right path and it has been widely endorsed and firmly supported by the Chinese people. Polls by multiple foreign institutions show that China enjoys the highest domestic support rate in its social system and development path among all the countries surveyed. If it is a successful path, why should we change course? If it enjoys the people's support, why should we give it up? One has to ask, for such a large country like China with so complex national conditions, what other system could have enabled the maintenance of unity and stability in China and enabled China to become an important force for global peace and security? What other path of development could have enabled the 1.4 billion Chinese people to eradicate poverty, move towards initial prosperity in all respects, and while creating its own miraculous development made so enormous contribution to human progress for a country with a long history stretching 5,000 years. China will maintain its strategic focus and cultural confidence. It will not be influenced by others. Still let's be swayed by others. We will stay firm on our own path and move ahead in a resolute ma manner. We are going to keep the future and destiny of our country and nation firmly in our own hands and keep pushing forward the great national renewal. At the same, of course, the path of development ahead China faces its long and winding and much remains to be desired. We welcome all well-intentioned advice and valuable opinions from foreign friends. At the same time, countries differ in national conditions and have different needs. We have all along respected the choices of other countries, the U.S. included, of their systems and paths. We will not, nor is it possible for China, to export our social system or development model. Still less will China follow the old path of past powers who sought hegemony. It is never China's intention to change the United States. Likewise, the United States should not seek to change China. 
the United States is working to make America great again and keeping America great. Like the American people, the Chinese people are also entitled to lead a better life. These two development goals we cherish are not mutually exclusive or a zero-sum equation. We may well help each other and work with each other. China's renewal will provide the U.S. with a stable and sustainable market for the long run. A vibrant U.S. will provide China's development with a better external environment. The key is to embrace an open mind and respect each other's right to development and appreciate each other's development accomplishments. In the final analysis, for the sake of our two countries and for this world, we must find a way for major countries, different in social system and cultural background, to live together on this planet in peace and cooperate with each other for win-win results. Fourth, shouldering responsibilities together accords with the trend of history, and neither of our two countries can replace the other. Some in the U.S. are hyping up the so-called shift of international power. They worry that China will challenge and unseat the United States from its role in the world. It is a strategic misjudgment about China and also reflects a lack of self-confidence. China is still the largest developing country in the world. It is far behind the U.S. in terms of per capita national income, the Human Development Index, and sophistication of science, technology, and education. Moreover, traditional Chinese culture stresses moderation and humility and believes kindness should be reciprocated and repaid. And seeking hegemony has never been in China's DNA. China has no intention to play the game of thrones on the world stage. For now and for the foreseeable future, the United States is and will still be the strongest country in the world. Mr. Zheng Xiaoping once said humorously, should the sky fall, there is the tallest guy to prop it up. We hope the United States will continue to play its due role for global peace and prosperity, and we welcome such a role. Meanwhile, in a world confronted with more and more global challenges, no country can do well in isolation or fix all the problems single-handedly. The sharing of international responsibilities is thus a natural trend. In this process, each country, big countries in particular, can well harness its comparative strength and play a role to the best of its ability. China is ready to fulfill its due share of responsibilities. When the world was hit by the financial tsunami 11 years ago, China and the U.S., together with other countries, worked in solidarity and effectively stemmed the crisis. Today, there are more destabilizing factors and uncertainties in the international situation, and there are various black swans and gray rhinos across the world. If and when another storm hits, the only choice for us is still to rally together in the same spirit and with one heart, one mind. As the second largest contributor to the UN regular budget and peacekeeping assessment, China has sent 39,000 peacekeeping military personnel to UN peace missions around the world, the largest among the permanent members of the UN Security Council. China has played an active part in the multilateral process of global governance regarding climate change, sustainable development, nuclear security, cybersecurity, and nonproliferation. China has been working with other countries for political settlements of hotspot issues, and we take seriously our cooperation and coordination with the U.S. on all of these issues. President Xi Jinping once pointed out that by working together, China and the U.S. can accomplish great things that benefit both countries and the world. 
The two presidents have agreed that our two countries need to manage differences on the basis of mutual respect, expand cooperation on the basis of equality and mutual benefit, and jointly advance the China-U.S. relations based on coordination, cooperation, and stability. So how to effectively implement what our presidents have agreed upon? I wish to share with you three observations. First, for areas where we can cooperate, we need to resolutely advance and deepen such cooperation in a win-win spirit. The truth is, in a fluid international situation, there are more and more areas where China and the U.S. can and should cooperate, issues ranging from fighting terrorism and drug-related crime to dealing with issues of the Korean Peninsula and Afghanistan, all require that our two countries engage in focused and deeper cooperation to benefit our peoples and lend new impetus to the growth of our relations in the new era. In the past weeks and months, the Chinese government has taken firm measures to schedule fentanyl-related substances in a whole class. This has become a new highlight in China-U.S. cooperation. In China-U.S. relations, economic cooperation has been the ballast and people-to-people -people exchanges, the propeller. The last thing we should do is to throw off the ballast or shut down the propeller. On the contrary, we need to build on the good work in place and craft new plans based on new realities, actively look for and expand our shared interest, and explore new areas of cooperation. Our people's desire for enhanced exchange and cooperation must be honored. Interactions on business, science, technology, education, tourism, culture, youth, and at the subnational level must be encouraged, not restricted or blocked. Second, for issues where we do not see eye to eye with each other, we need to have them properly managed in a spirit of no conflict or confrontation. It is nothing new that there is competition and disagreements between us. However, we must not let our minds be controlled by prejudice and apprehension or let our relationship be defined by conflict and confrontation. What we need is to have those differences properly handled and keep working to expand common ground while setting aside and easing differences to leave space for dialogue and open up prospects for cooperation. China's Belt and Road Initiative is not targeted at the U.S. We are open for dialogue and communication should the U.S. have any doubt about the initiative, but there should be no attempts to discredit or undermine it. Regarding the U.S. global alliance system and cooperation proposals, China will respect the traditional influence and actual interests of the United States, yet neither the alliance system nor the proposals should be predicated on harming Chinese interests or targeting China. There is no need for our two countries to guard against each other in Africa, Latin America, or the Middle East. Rather, we should increase mutual understanding and explore the possibility for tripartite cooperation. Our trade frictions need to be resolved through dialogue and consultation. China has kept its door to negotiation open, yet the, the negotiation must be based on mutual respect, equality, mutual benefit, and honoring one's word with action. Negotiation cannot take place under the threat or at the expense of China's legitimate right to development. In recent weeks, both sides showed some goodwill on tariffs. Last week, a vice ministerial consultation was held in Washington, D.C., and the consultation was constructive. Hopefully, the upcoming 13th round of uh, high-level economic and trade consultations will produce a positive outcome. China and the U.S. are countries with great wisdom. If we have dialogues as equals and pursue win-win cooperation, I'm sure we can figure out a solution to our differences. Third, 
for matters that involve each other's core interests, China and the U.S. need to stick to the principle of non-interference in others' internal affairs in a spirit of mutual respect. If the China-U.S. relationship is to remain stable, the most important thing is to respect each other's territorial sovereignty, social system, and development path, and not to impose one's will or model on the other. Let me stress that China did not and will not interfere in U.S. internal affairs, and we believe the American people can sort out their problems. Likewise, we expect the U.S. to treat us in the same spirit and not to interfere in China's internal affairs. The crux of the Taiwan question is that China faces the danger of the splitting of its land. And upholding national unity and territorial integrity is the bounden duty of all governments, the U.S. being no exception. China stands for and has actively worked toward peaceful reunification, yet we will never allow Taiwan independence to get its way. We hope the United States will faithfully honor the One China Principle and the three Sino-U.S. joint communiques and support the Chinese government in opposing Taiwan independence and separation. As for Hong Kong, the one country, two systems arrangement has achieved big success, a fact that no one can deny. To maintain Hong Kong's prosperity and stability, the pressing task now is to reject violence and defend the rule of law. We hope the U.S. will be consistent in its words and actions, respect China's sovereignty, and respect the efforts of the Hong Kong SAR government to stop violence and restore order. Moreover, let me say a few words about the Xinjiang region in China. The government of the Xinjiang Autonomous Region has recently taken a series of preventive measures according to law against terrorism. This is a purely Chinese internal affair, yet it has been deliberately discredited and attacked by some anti-China forces in the world. So what is the truth concerning this matter? The truth is that the Chinese government has all along attached importance to Xinjiang's stability and development to preserving its religion and culture. In the past 51 years since the region was established, the local economy has grown by 80 times. Several hundred thousand of local people have been lifted out of poverty. There are now over 28,000 religious sites in Xinjiang and close to 30,000 clerical personnel. Both figures have increased by tenfold compared with several decades ago. Nowadays, every 530 Muslim people in Xinjiang have a mosque on average, which is uh, higher than many Muslim countries. The truth is that the people of different ethnicities in Xinjiang suffer deeply from extremism and terrorism for the last over two decades. There have been several thousand cases of violent terrorism there since the 1990s, and thousands of innocent people were killed or injured. These attacks took a heavy toll on the life and property of the local people and their freedom of religious belief and other fundamental human rights. The truth is that the measures taken in Xinjiang in recent years have a clear-cut purpose, that is to prevent extremism and terrorism at their root. These measures are consistent with Chinese law and common approaches advocated in the global community. According to the UN Plan of Action to Prevent Violent Extremism, Poverty, unemployment, the absence of alternative employment opportunities, and low levels of education are the background causes of violent extremism, along with the distortion and exploitation by violent extremist groups of religious beliefs. The plan of action suggests early engagement and complementing the actions to counter violent extremism with preventive measures. That is precisely what Xinjiang has done. Visible progress has been made. There has uh, not been a single case of violent terrorism in the past 
three years. The truth is, the education and training centers in Xinjiang are schools that help the people concerned free themselves from the influence of extremism and terrorism and acquire professional skills. The centers are anything but horrific concentration camps. This year, we have invited nearly 1,000 personnel from the diplomatic, media, and economic circles of Western countries, including the U.S., to Xinjiang. They have seen the education centers firsthand and visited other places in Xinjiang. The impression they share is that the situation on the ground is far from what some Western forces and media have reported. Not long ago, some 50 countries, in a co-signed letter to the President of the Human Rights Council, expressed support for China's position on the Xinjiang-related issues. They pointed out the education and training centers and other measures in Xinjiang have effectively prevented extremism and terrorism, and the basic human rights in Xinjiang have been safeguarded. Among these co-signatories, nearly 30 countries are members of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Rumors find no market among the fair-minded and pale in the face of facts. Our measures in Xinjiang are all for the safety and happiness of the 25 million people of different ethnic groups in Xinjiang for contributing a great share to the international fight against terrorism. We are fully open and above board. And we're confident that no vile smears will work. We hope to present a true picture of Xinjiang to friends present t tonight and people from other countries. You're welcome to visit Xinjiang and see for yourselves the de development there, and we hope that no one will be misled or deceived by rumors. Friends, China-U.S. relations are the most consequential bilateral relationship in the world. As President Xi Jinping has emphasized, our two countries have a thousand reasons to grow the relationship and none whatsoever to wreck it. The future of China-U.S. relations and global peace and development hinges on us drawing upon the experience and lessons of history and on the choice we make and action we take today. I'm confident we may effectively enhance mutual trust, properly manage differences, and strengthen exchanges of cooperation in keeping with the principle of no conflict or confrontation, mutual respect, and win-win cooperation. China-U.S. relations will enjoy sound and steady growth, bringing greater benefits to the people of the two countries and beyond. Thank you very much.